Thank you very much for joining us um, in this session. I would like to introduce you to my guests as I have a seat. Thank you very much, ladies, for joining me. I have first um, Nongulego Gobodo, who is from uh, Gobodo Incorporated. Thank you very much, ma'am, for, for joining us. I also have Mary Vilakazi, as well as Debbie Ransby. Thank you very much, lazy, ladies, for joining us. So our topic uh, this afternoon is no glass ceiling. And I think we've heard about this phenomenon where we th we've heard that ladies can only get to thus far, or certain jobs are for the gents and ladies can't do certain things, but really there is no glass ceiling for any of us. We've got three really successful ladies, and I'll start with you, Debbie, because you're next to me. Can you tell me about um, an opportunity or a time where you've had the opportunity to to exceed a glass ceiling or was told you can only get so far and exceeded that. Thanks, Didi. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I don't believe there is such a thing as a glass ceiling. I believe that we create our own opportunities. Um, I've always had the approach that if an opportunity comes up, I'll put my hand up. Um, I'll say, pick me. It doesn't matter what the opportunity is. It may be, it may be perceived to be a sideways move but I believe that a new opportunity is something that you can learn from and, and broaden your exposure. So I have been involved in a lot of different things. Um, I think if people, people create their own glass ceilings, um, I think people must open their eyes, broaden their horizons, and, and just discard that, that term, because I don't believe, I personally don't believe it exists. And if someone says that there is a glass ceiling, every person has a right to challenge that. Um, I believe in hard work. I believe in setting your mind to something and doing everything you can to, to achieve it. That's, that's a very valid point. Uh, Mary, you are the deputy CEO of MMI Holdings. And I think, yes, a round of applause <laughs> to her for that. I think along your journey and with your career growing, you may have possibly heard that, oh, as a woman, there are no women CEOs or deputy CEOs. Can you tell us about um, your opportunities to grow? Okay, thanks, Didi, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I will, just to keep the session light-hearted, I would actually like to say that there is a glass ceiling. Um, because if there wasn't, the number of women that sit on boards and that run companies, I wouldn't get a clap. Because there'd be just so many of us. If you look at uh, that the proportion of the population that is female, um, you know, that is definitely not represented in the higher accolades. But I think I agree with Debbie, it is for us to smash it. And I suppose, I've, I, suppose I, I grew up in a privileged environment where I've got people like Sis Nongkulego who smashed it, you know? So it's there, but it's for us to smash. Um, and, 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 and I guess it's, we have these conversations around what are the different ways to smash it and push through. But we'll, I'll only believe that it's not there one day when um, government senior levels throughout the world, actually, because I think in South Africa we're doing quite well in certain pockets. But if you look at the women running NASDAQ companies, you look at the JSE, and it's 50% women, then I think we can talk about the fact that their ceiling's gone. But we're making progress. I think not so many years ago, women were nowhere to be found. You know, I think they were at home looking after children, and slowly that has actually improved. But nobody's ever said to me that oh, you know, as a woman, you can't get that far. But I grew up without role models, so some of these things are not said. You never have to say, oh, you know, you are not good enough. People and the behaviors around and so how society operates gives you those messages and you internalize them. So, I mean, when I started my career um, working at PwC, most of the managers were men. Most of the managers were white men. Um, and so what does that say to you? you know, so nobody has to say that you can't get there. It is just how the, the environment is organized that you start internalizing certain, me certain messages. And, and, and I guess um, it's the fact that the profession even looks slightly different, or environment looks slightly different, speaks to the progress that we are making. Yeah, so I think for me, the biggest thing I've had to challenge around last things is actually looking inside of me 
and looking at the messages that I might have internalized, not consciously, but by just existing in the society that I exist in, what is it that I might have, I might be holding in my mind, and therefore, when I come across those challenges, how do I need to react and prepare myself? So I can speak a bit more later on, it's my turn. Awesome, thank you very much for that. Ma'am, you are the CEO of Gobodo Incorporated, and that's not the first company that, <laughs> that you started. Um, so I, if, if I may, I think in your career, you sort of walked around with a baseball bat because you were <laughs> smashing <laughs> ceilings all the way along. Tell us about your journey. I'm a retired accountant. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not the CEO of Gobodo Incorporated. I'm the CEO of Nkululeko Leadership Consulting. I am in leadership consulting now. Well, I mean, she says I, I smashed the ceiling. I never thought that being the first black woman, uh, I smashed the ceiling. And she's right. Because I've never had ceiling. Where's the ceiling? Is, is there a ceiling? <laughs> yeah, I was never raised to think about ceilings. You know, um, I was raised by a very strong mother, a very strong father, who um, really just socialized us to not to think that there are things that we cannot do. So I grew up with a lot of affirmation and a, and a lot of inspiration because um, they refused to allow the system, you know, to define what they do uh, uh, and, and all of that. So for me, I had those role models of hardworking people in spite of the challenges. So the, the first time, I think, I suppose you realize that there's some sort of ceiling that as a woman, I, I start from a, a position of not, I'm not significant, you know, I'm dismissed, kind of, is when I started working. And let me tell you about the first job. So the first job, I took a gap year after, after the degree and lectured at, at uh, the University of Transkei then. The, the head of the department was going on sabbatical, so they were short-staffed. So first job, uh, the professor who's the head of department, I've just started, he calls me to his office and there's a pile of, you know, papers and whatever. Will you help me sort this out? I'm like, one thing I'm sure of, I'm not a student anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lecturer now, I'm not gonna sort out any papers for anyone. So that was sort of the first experience of, oh, I'm different, you know, as a black woman. So, um, be because of the fact that I never allowed those opinions to define me, I never saw this, this ceiling, I, when they dismissed me, I was like, you don't even know who I am, you know. <laughs> uh, your, your little opinions don't define me. So, um, and it became clear as she's saying, okay, because I qualified uh, back those days, I mean, it was a big thing to qualify in second year. So they promoted me and, and gave me this uh, new position of, of supervisor in the portfolio and the team. <laughs> I, I trained in Amtata, I look at the list, did it, Pindamase, uh, Jimmy's Fruitaras, I thought, oh, I'll never have my own firm <laughs> auditing these clients. So I went to the white supervisor who had all the clients I wanted. I was not gonna scream, because I'm a black woman, you are giving me all these jobs. <laughs> so um, I ended up taking over his portfolio. So I suppose, for me, there's no glass ceiling. That's awesome. And I think a point that you raised there was uh, the, when you were growing up, you had a lot of affirmations mm. and you are a result of two strong parents who were instrumental in making you understand that you shouldn't be apologetic. I'll move back this way. Uh, Mary, let's talk about relationships, your, your family. Has your family been supportive and how has your family been instrumental in who you are today? Um, my family is... Um, my biggest anchor and pillar in, in, in my career journey, really. Um, I was also brought up by, 
I, I come actually from quite a matriarch family, so lots of aunts, you know, who are in my business and <laughs> my mother. So I, 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 I'm, I, I'm really privileged in the sense that I think in my family it's like strong women, you know, that 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 um, can't continuously come up for me as the people that have. Um, that have encouraged me. I, I always think of my mother um, would come back. My mother worked very hard. And there were only two times that she engaged with me on my schooling, and well, that was when we got the reports. And at that time, I think you were like 70 in a class and you got a position. I don't know if any people went to school here when you were <laughs> position one of 70. So I would come back and then I would start off the year. And somehow, I, never, I always was like slow to start. So I'd come and I'd be like, yeah, I'm number three of 73. And my mother will be like, okay, should I tear it now or later? I'm like, but Mama, three. I mean, and we had those conversations, and then I would always have to look at that disappointed face when she looked back and said, you know, when I'm at work, I keep on thinking you're working hard, but number three. And then that would hang on me, and then come end of the year, I would be number one, and then we'd be friends again. So I always used to think about those two conversations, but somehow in January, I would forget again, and then we started off there, and then ended the year well. So my mother's always been, a, I think, a, a, a person that instilled in me the importance of hard work. So for me, it was never, and, and she would always just check in with me around where am I, what am I planning on doing, and the rest she would leave. Very different with me, I try and micromanage my children, but now and then I need to remember that I was never micromanaged. She instilled just values of hard work and just kept on re-emphasizing that part. Um, I mean, and later on, I was quite fortunate that I met friends uh, when I was um, at school and particularly in varsity that to this day, um, I consult with a lot. I consult with a lot on career things and things that I'm battling with as a mother, as a professional, and, and, and I think that has really helped me quite a lot. I also married well, but I think if there's anybody that knows my husband here, please don't tell him I said that. <laughs> uh, I married well, and, and I, I, I married a man whose mother was extremely strong. You know, she was again a matric. Um, there was a few years ago when I wanted to, op out, I wanted to check out um, from this very hectic life of work. And I was considering being a working, staying home mom and all of that. And he said, you know what, that will be a basis for divorce. I honestly married you because I thought you were going to actually do something with your talent. And he's never given me that space, you know, and, and I think he is really amongst one of my biggest supporters because I think all those, you know, the support you get at home for sometimes what is really a hard and lonely journey um, in being a professional woman, you, you really need your family to be behind you. And, and the last one, I think it's just the relationships I've built at work. So whether it's with people that I report to, my, my biggest um, criteria is that I, I work for bosses, I don't work for companies. Um, so I have to select my bosses very well and ensure that they're going to be supportive of me and they're going to make sure that the environment enables me to actually um, p perform. So, so I choose bosses as opposed to companies and I suppose now my role is to ensure that um, the company is full of those bosses for many people, so role is a little bit different. So that's very important and because I think you really can't get a lot done um, from a professional point of view if you don't have the relationships of people you can lean on that can support you, that you can bounce off ideas, particularly when you have those very difficult times um, that you're going through. That's, that's uh, really good to hear. Debbie, you're also married to a very supportive man. And do you have children, Debbie? Yes, I do. I, I have two little girls. Um, I have a... Should I talk about my family? Yes, please <laughs> tell us how they support um, you in your career. <laughs> so my husband has his own business. Um, he's never worked in a corporate environment like, like I'm in at the moment. So he doesn't always understand some of the challenges that I face. But he's, he is 100% supportive. Um, I travel a lot, so I spend quite a bit of time away from home. Um, my daughters are four and seven, so they're still little. And I want to teach them that there's no glass ceiling. And every day we talk about our highs, we talk about our lows, what went well today, what did we learn today. And it's, it's creating that environment where they are happy to talk, where they share their successes. We all share our successes uh, because I think that's really important. Um, when my little four-year-old wrote her name for the first time, that was a big deal for all of us, and we, and we all got involved. Um, 
So I want to teach them that, this, that they can do whatever they put their, their minds to. Um, my parents also have always been very supportive. Um, they look after my children every afternoon so that I can do the work that I do. Um, I, I want them to know that hard work is the recipe for success, that um, they, they must create their own opportunities. And also what I found with, with my daughters is that it's teaching them independence, that mommy's not always there. So mommy will make sure she's there for the important events. Um, I have had to miss a few due to work commitments, but when it's a end of year concert, I make sure that I'm there. And when there's a Mother's Day tea, I make sure that I'm there. But when I'm not there, they're okay. Um, my daughter does her homework on her own. Um, and, and it's building that sense of independence that she's not always 100% reliant on me, that there are other people that are there to look after her, to support her, and to teach her some of the life, life lessons that my, the grandparents, um, they're very involved and, and they're teaching them lessons that I ne wouldn't necessarily teach them. Mm. So working in, in a corporate environment, sometimes you're in a conference call for three hours and then you're rushing off to the airport and then you're, your PA is telling you that, oh, you missed calls from these people and then you have to return those calls. And you're saying that at no point can you go to every single soccer match. Ma'am, you said that um, during Women's Month, you couldn't go to every cricket and soccer match and you are a mother of boys and uh, you did it on your own. Um, if you are willing, can you share with us how you managed to build a company and bring up boys? Yeah, being a, a single parent is not something I wish for anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you, you are ambitious and, and you, you're not willing to sacrifice your own career for, for the children. I got divorced very early on and so I had to raise like three children on my own. And I suppose, you know, when you are in business, you sort of <laughs> become a businesswoman at home as well. <laughs> this is what they told me later. <laughs> but I was always so tough, you know, there were tickets. <laughs> <laughs> what is your target mark for, <laughs> mark for, for the end of the year, biology, <laughs> maths? <laughs> kind of situation, so I'm sure I was a very um, strong mother. But I mean, I suppose people think that it, it's difficult or easy, but it's a choice that you make, you know, and, and it's a hard choice. It's not an easy choice. And it was not an easy choice to not to be there, you know, for my children. And I suppose at, at that time, when you are just pursuing career and doing your best as a mother, I, I always made sure that I was a very present mother. I, I knew that I had this responsibility to raise these children to, be, to contribute to society in their own right. So that, that was, that's why I was like, targets. <laughs> um, but it was actually very hard. I mean, there were times when I would cry in my own ho in a hotel room because I've left my children for three months building Koboido Incorporated in Jobek, you know. Um, but later on, when they, they grew up, we had to deal with this thing, open the wounds. And that's when they, they told me things like, you missed my uh, preschool graduation. I'm like, <laughs> you're 20 something. <laughs> Why are we talking about missing preschool? That's when I realized those wounds were, mm -hmm. Hard. It was hard for them, but it was hard for me too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Mary, you spoke about something that's very important, and that's the relationship you, you have with the people you went to university with and the, and the career friends that you started making. So the people that you got to your first firm with, and you had the same anxieties, and you started building yourselves up. And also you spoke about bosses. And I'm going to touch up on uh, leadership and management. Um, those relationships are, are the, the people that you can now go back to 10 years later and say, remember the, the one client we worked on? We had that difficult situation. How did we get out of this? And um, can you speak a bit more about professional relationships? Um, one, of my, one of my closest friends, um, her name is Funega Monjani. She's the CEO of the retail business at Standard Bank. <laughs> 
um, awesome lead, yes. Um, so, so her and I met at Varsity, and, and I mean, Funega is like highly driven. And, and, and for me, she was, I used to look at her and think, where did she come from? <laughs> <laughs> Extremely focused, um, very passionate about it is that she actually um, tends to do. And, and her and I, I'll come back to the question you're asking, but her and I used to sit and we would decide who we date and we would do net present value calculations. <laughs> so, so at least we, you know, my boss is like, mm, no, okay, the NPV is not that great. <laughs> so, but, um, so, so we started coaching each other way back then. But we always reflect on this particular conversation because we both got it wrong. Um, she's married to one of my friends who's more into education. He was a lawyer and went into education. My husband is a nuclear physicist, so he's in academia. So the net, net present value calculations were <laughs> absolutely incorrect. <laughs> but we did marry two supportive men who, who, are, who are the biggest champion. But I mean, I find that you know, I'm able to, um, to, to, to bounce quite a lot of difficult things. Um, and I mean, I guess you're always conscious of, okay, what is now, when you're, especially when you work for a listed company, what is, you know, what, you, what is it that you can't share? But for the most part of it, I, you know, I find that with a couple of my other friends as well that we met at uh, PwC and others that I've known, that's probably where I okay. solve most of my problems. Um, because it's a safe space, you know, I can go, geez, I'm really struggling, but you actually really think I'm up to this job. <laughs> You know, I can't ask my boss that. He's going to yeah. not give me the job. You know, um, I can't really say that to the board or anybody else, but there's like, at least it's a safe, contained space where we all trust each other. And I, and I found that it's helped me a lot. Um, and, 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 and I think what's also useful is having male um, friends as well. In, in, in that process because I guess the conversations are always so different. I mean, I, I love getting advice from my male friends because they, all the things that are very complicated to women. I mean, we want to wait until we are 110% ready for the role. Yeah. They are like 60%, I think I understand what the role is. There's my hand. <laughs> I, I can do it. So I, I you know, so I, I, I find that always just very helpful in terms of diversity of thoughts um, for people that I tap into who are, who are, who are in my, in, in my ecosystem. And then I also like getting input from people that, that aren't my supporters. I, I, I always look out for people that think differently to me, that don't agree with me, and, 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 and that voice I find extremely valuable in whatever considerations I make for, for my decisions. And I mean, I think my husband is, is a big one because often he doesn't agree with me. When I left PwC, um, and again, it was to actually spend time with my eldest daughter, um, who's now since passed on. Um, and I, take, I took the time to, and I said, you know, I dropped her off at school, and I'm not sure that child's going to call me when she gets to varsity. So he says, why would she not call you? I'm like, okay, maybe I should rephrase it. I think she's going to call me asking for money. <laughs> but I'm not sure she's going to phone me and say, mama, I'm not well. And so for me, that became a big thing. And I ended up leaving PwC. And he thought, this woman is really mad. And then I went to go work for an entrepreneurial firm. And I used to wear my yoga pants there because it was very all laissez-faire. So my daughter and him used to sit and talk about me and think, why does she think she's making a sacrifice for me? Mm -hmm. I don't need to see her in yoga pants. I enjoyed seeing my mom in heels, wearing yeah. a suit, and actually going to work. And, and so anyway, they had this dialogue, but during those times, I think back to Nongkilogo's point, is that these things are actually more for you. You know, during yeah. that time when my daughter didn't appreciate the fact that I had this job that was quite laissez-faire, and my husband also wasn't particularly the proudest, um, I mean, I learned a lot, you know, so at some stage I'd realized that, okay, these decisions you actually make for yourself. So why am I where I am? And then I realized I actually chose that company because I wanted to learn more about running a more entrepreneurial business versus corporate. Um, and it became my journey and my story, you know, and I, it was less about, oh, I'm spending time with the kids. Because my daughter was like, mm, that's not really, this is your story. And, and I learned a lot from, from that part. So I said, so I... I leverage a lot from really the personal relationships that I have with me. I mean, I've got mentors that are over there, but I think the ones of the people closest to me, um, listening to them is really where my biggest learnings come. Um, thank you for that contribution. It was 
uh, quite interesting. <laughs> Debbie, have you always been a tequila or where have you been? And um, in those relationships that you've formally created, are there people that you worked with 10 years ago that you can still call and say, I'm stuck? Yeah, so I started out at PwC many, many years ago. And um, I, I stayed for about five years. And I have a partner that I still speak to. Um, we share a birthday, so it's quite, it makes it a little bit easier. So we, we phone each other and we, we connect. Um, he's retiring this year, which is... Also a guy friend. Yes, <laughs> which is astonishing that he's retiring because I always saw him as this young, kind of vibrant, energetic man, and now he's retiring. So it just shows how quickly the time's going. Um, I then moved to GlaxoSmithKline, and I had a mentor there. He was, I was the finance manager and he was the, the managing director and we had an instant messenger application and at six o'clock in the evening I'd get a message from him, please see me. And I walked down the passage not knowing what I was walking into and it was the best, it was the best time for me. He would just mentor me, he would sit and talk about different topics and ask me how I felt about different things. I learned so much from him. That was 12 years ago. Um, he's now based in Dubai. I still see him regularly. If I'm in Dubai, I'll meet him for breakfast. If he's in South Africa, we meet up. And he's one person, um, a few years ago, we were given responsibility for managing Algeria. And he was very familiar with the local environment. And I phoned him and I said, please help me. I don't know anything about Algeria. How's the pharmaceutical industry? What do I need to watch out for? Um, I've been told X, Y, and Z, is it, is it true, is it, is it realistic? And um, it, it's created so much value for me. Um, he said to me not so long ago, in fact, on his last visit to South Africa, he's seen how much I've grown over the years. And he's now asking me for advice, oh, which is really nice. Um, it's, it's, it's those kinds of relationships. And I've got a few. I mean, th this one stands out because he's the best leader I've ever seen. Um, and I often refer back to, I, I think about him when I'm faced with tough decisions. How would he have approached this? How, you know, what would he do? What would he say? Um, so I have a huge amount of respect for him. Um, my, when I moved to what was Nikomed and now Tequila, um, I worked for my, for my manager for nine and a half years. He's, he left about six weeks ago. Um, so it's been very diff uh, different not having him around. Um, I learned different things from him. He's a different personality. He's got a completely different management style. Um, I still speak to him a couple of times a week. Um, and, and that's another relationship that I think will last forever. Um, I haven't, I actually haven't worked for, for a woman before. Um, I had, to, had a dotted line into a lady in Dubai, which was a challenge. Um, not because she was a lady, just because she was far away. <laughs> <laughs> she was far away, and she was very tall, and I'm very short. <laughs> and she was far away. <laughs> and she, and would stand, <laughs> she would stand over me and try and intimidate me. And <laughs> just dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mary spoke about um, being hired by a, a specific person because that's the person that you report into, that is the person that, uh, who gives you your deadlines, who's accountable for you as well, who needs to speak about your salary raise and your bonus, etc. cetera. Um, but at the end of the day, with all of those relationships uh, at play, you still have yourself. So I'm just gonna ask you ladies, uh, before we go to the audience to get one or two questions, because time is not our friend this afternoon, who are you and what has made you so strong and so good at what you are and who you are today? Oh. <laughs> who am I? <laughs> uh, I suppose, I mean, we can't answer that question really. But I mean, I suppose, the, I mean, the most important thing for me was that what was the, the driving force in my life was to prove to myself and others that there was nothing I couldn't do. So when they said I couldn't have my own business, I said, why not? I'm going to have my own business. When they said I can only have a small business, I said, why can't I have a big one? You know, um, and, and so I suppose the challenges that, have, that were there for me as a black woman, th those are the challenges that I turned around 
I always say being black gave me purpose. <laughs> I, I don't know if I was a white person somewhere in America, how my life would have been. But I mean, not that it was easy to, to keep just pushing the, the boundaries and all of that, but to, to see yourself achieve these things, I remember when we established Goboda Incorporated back then in, in, in 1996, no, this was my dream when I was in Amtata to have a medium-sized black accounting firm. And then one day I walked into my, our offices on Empire, you know, I, I went into our boardroom, said a little prayer, I was like, wow, you used to be just a dream, uh, and now you, you exist. So I suppose, yeah, that's who I am, just pushing boundaries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the question is who, so, so what has made you who you okay. are? What's All been right. the driving Thank force you. to, no, to bash was, the ceilings? I was, I was <laughs> transported into the boardroom <laughs> moment, though, so I forgot exactly what, why I'm sitting here. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I grew up in Alex. Um, my, my aunt was a domestic worker working in Santon, in Sundown. I, I, I now live within a kilometer of where she used to work. And I get there and I think, wow, look at how these people are living. I want to actually also live like this. Um, so I was, um, and I remember my mother trying to explain to me that, yeah, but it's only white people, Nana. Like, and I, I, was un I was battling to understand why, you know, so thankfully I was born at a time when apartheid was going to end. I think I would have been extremely frustrated or I might have even let the MK myself. So, so I, I, I grew up really with a strong desire to have a different experience to what I had, and, and, and that made me focus, and I looked at how my mother kept on studying. I think she was always in night school until she got matric and did courses and so forth, and I could see what happens when you focus and you, you work on improving yourself, and I could see the strides she's made versus what could have been of her life. So, I, so for me, my, my only recipe was hard work and focus, and, and I think layer to that, you do need stars to align, but if you run that race very well prepared, you know, at least when the opportunity comes your way, you can grab it. Um, but I mean, I've also seen people that have worked very hard. I've had to nuance that story because I've seen people that have worked very hard where if they don't get any opportunity, you know, I can't, sometimes the success is not so clear. I think we don't live in a society that's equal. Opportunities do not actually come equally to people. But if you run your race and you are well prepared and you happen to be at the right time, then you can at least grab on these ropes when they come your way. So that's been kind of my, 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 my story. And I think also what's helped me is um, just listening to myself. So some of the stories, some of the reasons why I left certain routes and why I find myself here, I'm always linear, and I'll always, it's not like I set out to actually be sitting in one of the financial services companies at the moment, and I, I never work out my story that way. I always try and find enjoyment in what I'm doing, work hard, and show that I'm paid a lot. Um, it's very important for women to not forget that we need to <laughs> get paid extreme. But, but I think that, I, I, that there's growth for me. Any opportunity that I take, I must, under, I must see how I'm going to grow or how it's actually going to enable me. And so some of the moves are, are a bit brave when I, listen, when, when I reflect on that. But I think using the same support structures that I have of people questioning me and just the, and backing myself to know that I'll make a success of whatever opportunity comes my way, as long as it's something that I want to do. Um, so so that's, that's, that's pretty much, I suppose, what, what, what I'm about or how I've traveled my road. Thank you so much for that. And Debbie, please. So um, I think I've always been the kind of person that if I take on a task, I do it to the best of my ability. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be obviously at work, it can be baking a cake for my child's birthday, it can be swimming a race, it doesn't matter, I must always do my best. Um, the other part is working with a group of people that I trust um, and being in an environment that fits my value system. Um, the pharmaceutical industry is very ethical, there are a lot of regulations, there are a lot of things that you need to comply with and, and that, that works for me. Um, I work with like-minded people um, and I think I work in an environment where people are encouraged to always do their best. Um, 
we try and create opportunities for people to, to perform at the highest level and to learn. And I encourage everyone that I work with to try and learn something new every day. So I like to work with people that have the same approach as I do, that they always do their best, that I know that I can rely on them. Um, so that at the end of the day, we can be proud of whatever we've achieved. Thank you so much for that. I do want to thank um, our panelists uh, in them opening up about their lives and their experiences. But if there's anyone itching, I'll take two questions. And when I do take your question from you, please can you give me your name, which institution you're from, and then shoot straight into your question. Do I have any questions? Right here in the front. Afternoon, everyone. I'm Gyabetu from Sanlam. My question is for you, um, I'm Gululek. Is that what um, traits do you think are lacking in leaders today? And what advice would you give to an employee going to a leadership position for the first time? I suppose <laughs> right now we just need ethical leaders. Yeah. It's, it's what we, we, we really need in South Africa right now. And, and I would say to, to a young person getting into a leadership position, it's so Im important for you to be an effective leader. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, because effectiveness is achieving the goal, is achieving the purpose that was set. Because I don't care if you are busy, but you're not achieving the goal, then you are not effective. We need effective organizations. I mean, in South Africa, we have so much to catch up on. So we cannot afford to have leaders who are not taking us forward. So whatever position, whether you're supervising two people, how are you taking those two people and that unit forward? That should always be the, the, the question uh, that you ask yourself as a leader. Thank you very much, ma'am. And the next question? Okay. I'm gonna have to skip over to you. Just remember to give me your name, your institution, and straight into Okay, my name is Nangwani Mawera. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm working for Ondaka Property Group. It's my own company. Uh, my question is to, uh, to, to Ms. Kobodo. I, I want to ask about um, the, the different, uh, how it was when you were still running your firm alone and, and when you get partnership, the, the benefits of partnership and, and, and the difficulties when you were running on your own. Thank you. They can answer too. <laughs> well, I suppose when I, when I was young, it was all about me, you know. Uh, I'm clear where I'm going, just follow me. If you can't, if, if you can't catch up, just run after me <laughs> and, ke and keep up. But as you grow older, you realize that partnerships are important because you need people who can complement you. And also, uh, people, you know, they, they have their own worldview. Because you see the world in a certain way, you, th you think that everyone sees the world the same way. But as you grow older, you realize that, and you begin to appreciate that good relationships at work are important. Yes, you have to choose your partners, I mean, those who share your same values as you, because if you make a mistake there, in terms of choosing partners, you're going to get into trouble. So um, it, it's really all about knowing that you can't do it alone. You need others to get far, you know. But you don't want, we made those mistakes, you know, start a business, fight, and, and go and start again. Young people, we don't want that anymore. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you would join me in giving our panelists a big applause for breaking through. Thank you.